time that expert had ever testified as a treating, treating doctor. In 2009, I was named California trial, uh, Orange County Trial Lawyer of the Year regarding a police misconduct case. The reason we won that case, and it took five years to get the case to trial, is I brought in an expert who after the case was, was resolved, and we got a jury verdict for our clients for $5.5 million, the jury told me one of the main reasons they, they, they came back with their verdict the way they did is because of how comfortable they were with our expert, how they felt that he was a leader in the courtroom, how his testimony and his approach, as opposed to the other side's expert, made a difference in our case. And I actually agreed with their feedback. He was excellent. Uh, a recent million dollar ambulance negligent transport case that we tried, our expert was a fire captain in Orange County that had never tested before in his life. It's the first time he was an expert and that's why I wanted him. I went over these seven tips with him. We went in and he outshined and outperformed and, and gained the trust and likability factor with the jury as opposed to the other side's ex expert that, who was terrible, okay? Mm -hmm. What I'm sharing with you guys, those are three real world examples of exactly how powerful these tips are. So we're gonna go through seven tips that you guys can use and put to use as early as this afternoon. The first thing is qualifications and credibility. Once again, we're not gonna talk about that, but I want you guys to focus on your personality and people skills. Why it's so important to, even though you're right, you've got an opinion about something, you know exactly what that opinion is, we're in the people game. We're in the human to human connection, build rapport game critically important to work on your people skills. How do you deal with other people? How do you deal with the opposing counsel who's being difficult or rude during a deposition or during a trial? How do you answer a question in a way where you are using your expertise to kind of put the other side and take them down the right path? Maybe check them a little bit, dropping gloves and checking them a little bit, but do so in a way where you're not alienating the jury. People skills are critically important, both a lawyer as an expert witness, and frankly, in business and in life. So when it comes to, to learning people skills, this is something that we're not born with. This is something that you can learn. And I love mentoring young trial lawyers. I will not mentor a young trial lawyer anymore until they've read the book, Adversaries into Allies by Bob Burke. It's that good. It's a people skills book. And Bob, you may recognize the name. He's also the co-author of the Go-Giver series of books. He's yeah, and sir, friend. will you Go repeat ahead. Will you repeat the name? Because I'm, I'm, I'm friendly with Bob and I know him mm -hmm. from the Go-Giver, but what's the name of this new book? So it's actually not a new book. It's, it's probably 10, 12 years old, but it's Adversaries into Allies. And it's okay. one of my favorite books of all time. And it will, it will show you and teach you people skills, things they don't teach us in law school or in engineering school or wherever you got your professional background. And what Bob's done is he's broken down people skills into five principles of ultimate influence. And I'm gonna run through those with you quickly because you can go out and get the book. And once you get the book, you're gonna come back to me and say, Mitch, that was really, really good because it's going to teach you how to deal with other people. The first principle that Bob shares in his book using storytelling and using his, his experiences growing up with his dad uh, focuses around controlling your emotions. Okay. You want to control your emotions in a deposition and in a trial. When I look at some of the questions that were submitted, uh, submitted Nick, mm -hmm. they revolve around somebody being rude. They revolve around somebody losing his or her temper during a deposition and uh, maybe uh, one of the most the one that came in while while we were going live was what do we do when an attorney's bullying so at oh, perfect I, time you know and, and so so bob gives you some tools and some approaches on on how to deal with your emotions and how to appreciate and understand why someone else is being emotional and how to deal with that uh short answer for lawyers do this Stop talking, stop talking and start listening. Start watching what you're doing. Understand the context of what's being discussed. Is it gamesmanship during a deposition? Is that lawyer trying to look good in front of his or her client? 
or is that lawyer genuinely having a bad day or is that just the way this lawyer is, right? So number one is boss is how to deal with our emotions and the emotions of others. Number two, to understand that we all have different belief systems. Why I believe and why I think things should be done are maybe completely different than Nick or opposing counsel in a deposit or trial. Once you understand this mindset and you get the fact that it may, just because you think something's being a certain way doesn't mean that's the reality in your deposition. Well, I finish a case, I walk into the elevator, and as I walk into the elevator, there's a gentleman standing there by himself. It's the end of a long day of trial. I don't know who this was, didn't know who it was. And he looked upset. He was crying. I was a little bit concerned to be in the elevator alone with him. Something wasn't right, but I'm in there, four floors up. I'm, I'm coming up with all of these beliefs about who this person is. Why is he in our courthouse? Why did I put myself in the elevator with him? When the elevator door on the first floor opened up, the doors opened up and there was nothing but press. And who this person was, was the surviving brother of a murder victim 15 minutes after the jury came back and found the defendant guilty in a case. So this wasn't my case. Right. And so he was emotionally shook up. He finally had some resolution. My belief on who he was was completely different than what was really going on. And so Bob shows you in Adversaries and Allies how to deal and understand and appreciate other people's belief systems. The third principle out of the five uh, is to acknowledge the other person's ego. We all have egos, especially experts and lawyers. <laughs> Putting experts and lawyers together, right, sometimes mm -hmm. can be like this. Not so much in my world because I practice what I preach, you guys. This stuff really works. But understand that we're dealing with type A personalities and we're dealing with, with egos. And so once you learn and understand and, and appreciate that fact, Bob gives you some tools on how to deal with, the, with other people's egos. And sometimes it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Instead of disagreeing with a lawyer during a deposition or when you're being cross-examined on the stand in trial, it has more to do with how you, what your initial response is to that lawyer's question. Okay, so just understand that there's egos involved and there are ways to deal with egos. Number four, you wanna set the proper frame or framework of exactly what's going on. Oftentimes people are asking you a question on this issue over here and you may feel the need to answer the question addressing these five issues over here, mm -hmm. okay? What's your framework? What is the framework, the, 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 um, the level that your, the party who's hiring you wants to, to respond to an issue, to a topic, to a question? And what is the other side looking for? What, what's the framework of the issues that you're offering expert testimony about? And the fifth principle of influence, the fifth principle of people skills has to do with communicating with tact and with empathy. Okay, nine times out of 10, and Nick will tell you, I'm a nice guy and I'm pretty low keyed. I'm also someone that's gotten into a couple of fights in law school. Not many lawyers can say that. Okay, there's a time to drop gloves and there's a time, oftentimes 99 times out of 100, it's you wanna be empathetic, you wanna be tactful in how you approach issues and how you respond to questions. I think, Nick, tip number one is that if people and experts work on their people skills mm -hmm. and and dive into you know Bob's book adversaries into allies I think that's going to right there put you ahead of 90% of the experts out there not only experts giving deposition testimony or experts testifying at trial but experts getting hired I don't hire assholes yeah okay I my life's already complicated and stressful and I'm dealing with life-changing issues for my clients the last thing I want is an expert that has an ego, is difficult, is a pain in the ass to deal with. Excuse my French, I don't know if That's, I can. It's fine. And, but it's, it's, I'm trying to make a point. It's accurate, and, yeah. It, you know, and so take all of this into consideration and build and develop your people skills like I have over the years. I mean, I've really worked hard at this. And I think that first out of seven tips will, will change everything when it comes to getting hired, making your point and helping your client prevail at arbitration, mediation, or trial. Along those same lines, Nick, 
And then after this section, we can take a break and maybe yeah. we'll have a couple of yeah, follow-ups. Yeah. So, so along those same lines, learn how to be likable, right? Learn how to smile. Learn how to, I get being the expert that's in there to take care of business and offer your opinion. I get that. But people like being around other people who are likable, who are enchanting. And one of the tools or links I'd like to share with everyone today is Guy Kawasaki has a YouTube video. And if you guys type into Google, keys to increasing your likability into YouTube, go to YouTube and type in keys to increasing your likability by Guy Kawasaki. It's a presentation that Guy gave at Stanford University about how to be enchanting, how to be likable, but here's the best part, how to smile. And it's not just one of these smiles, it's a big smile showing your crow's feet, embracing who you are as a human being. I'm telling you guys, whether it's getting hired or coming across as a human being in a deposition or a trial, if you incorporate guys' likability and enchantment approaches into what you do, not only as a professional expert, but home after work with your family, what a game changer. Yeah, what a game changer. So the first thing is work on the people skills. And, and then after that, we're going to slide on over to the second thing, which is communication skills. Excellent. That's great. Uh, uh, there are a couple of questions that came in. So I just want to uh, address sure. some of these that are, are housekeeping. This is being recorded. Uh, I did cut off a little bit of my early introduction. So it came in a little late. A uh, reminder for everybody that we're with Mitch Jackson 2013 California Lawyer of the Year. I'm Nick Rishwain with experts.com. Mitch is our guest uh, today. He's got 34 years of trial experience uh, and he's sharing how his uh, seven tips for experts. So that I've seen some of those questions come in. So I just want to let everybody know it is being recorded. You will get uh, the replay of this. There are not outlines or PowerPoint slides because Mitch and I don't operate that way. We find it a little, no. uh, a little boring and less engaging. Uh, so just uh, those are a couple, couple of questions that I've seen pop in. Uh, Mitch, I'm going to let, and I will add this to your last topic, Mitch, about people skills. I've actually had the experience of being at a wedding. Uh, Mitch and I were at a wedding together in attendance for uh, a mutual friend. Right. And he operates this level of people skills more than, way better than I do. He was yeah. engaging with everybody who talked to him at the wedding and is, is really fantastic uh, at this. So you. follow this suggestion at uh, the, the Bob Berg book and go and yeah. look at the Kai Kawasaki. I'm going to go look at the Guy Kawasaki YouTube because that, that sounds like something I need to know. So those are just a couple of housekeeping uh, points and I wanted to drive home that you really do operate the way you're telling us to operate today. Well, thank you, Nick. I'm going to have to work on my skills though, because I did try to get you out on the dance floor with me and, uh, and I was not successful. So I'm good, but I'm obviously not up to the Nick Rishwain level of persuasion, but I'm going to work on that next wedding. I see you at, we're yeah. going to get you out of the dance floor with Lisa and me. Yeah. To be clear, it was, it was Lisa who was really pushing for it. Your wife, Lisa was you really keep telling pushing. yourself that <laughs> I wanted you out there as much as she could. Yeah. Here's the thing, you guys, I actually grew up kind of an introvert. Um, I've always done the type of sports where I'm doing my own thing, whether it's motocross or hang gliding. It's, it doesn't involve other people. I played sports in high school, but I just like doing my own thing. This is something I've kind of developed, Nick, over the years. I realized as a lawyer, as a trial lawyer, and I think the same thing applies as an expert witness, you've got to create, you've got to develop your people skills and become a people person, at least in public. And when I come that, home, I shut, I shut down when I come home. Right. And, but I, part of that would segue perfectly into your next item, which is communication absolutely, skills. Absolutely. And I do want everyone to know uh, if you have any questions about any resources I've mentioned or links that I've shared. Uh, I don't know if Nick's going to be sharing this in the show notes. If you reach out to me, I'll share this information with you again. It's not a big deal. Uh, I love this stuff. So the second thing is of our seven next level tips to be a good effective expert witness is to work on your communication skills. It's one thing to be really good at what you do but unless you can communicate your message to opposing counsel in a deposition 
or maybe indirectly to that to the opposing counsel's client who might be sitting in the deposition unless you can communicate that message to a judge or a jury during trial or mediation or arbitration it's not going to do you any good and so one of the things I wanted to focus on is I think effective communication is more than just sharing the facts. It's, it's making your point using short stories. I think one of the effective approaches to communication, even for experts, is to think in your mind, is what I'm going to say, am I going to cover these three things? Three things. Number one, some level of emotion. Now, your emotion level needs to be appropriate to the topic, to what you're testifying to, but I want your audience, whether it's opposing counsel or a jury of 12 or a jury of eight in federal court, I want them to understand that you're passionate about the position that you're presenting as an expert witness. Not that you have a stake in the outcome, but you're comfortable and passionate and confident about what you're telling them. You know what you're doing. Okay, the other elements are you want to create your communication in a way where it's novel or unique. In other words, be yourself. No one else can be you. Don't try to be like the expert next door or someone you saw on TV or someone you watched on a webinar last month or last year. Be yourself. If you're yourself, you're going to connect. You're going to be real, transparent, and it's going to allow you to share your own uniqueness. The last thing is you want to communicate your message in a memorable way. One way to do that is using metaphors, and we're going to talk about that. So as long as you're emotional, unique, and you create a memorable message, if you're on the stand, if you're in a deposition, that might include using diagrams, exhibits. It might include using your hands. It might include standing up, walking over to a, uh, a PowerPoint, whatever it might be. You want to make sure you cover those three elements when you're communicating. Along those same lines, what I've seen, Nick, in both depositions, consultations and trial is sometimes experts are asked a question and it's an opinion and they immediately just give their opinion okay oftentimes you guys this is an opportunity to go through five steps it's it's what i like to call five steps to effective persuasion and i'm just going to run through them with you quickly it may not apply uh to your next trial but i think you're going to find that this technique works i know it works for me in trial, it works for me at the office when I'm talking to a client who's thinking about hiring us, and it works for me at home when I'm negotiating with Lisa, my wife and my partner, wife of 32 years, and we've been partners for 32 years at the law firm, on what movie we're going to watch on a Friday night. So here's the thing. The first thing you want to do is you want to state the problem. In other words, you're being asked an opinion about something, and in your response, state the problem. Listen, that's a great question. I think we can all agree the answer to that question is premised upon and then state the problem. The next step you want to do, and you don't want to go to step number five, which is the conclusion. Work your way through this. The next step you want to do, step number two, is to agitate the problem. If we don't fix this problem, if we don't do X, then we're going to see Y. In today's world, if we don't stay home, okay, then we're not going to flatten the curve. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's step two. Step three is offer a solution, a clear and concise solution. Step four is show how that solution helps your audience, helps your, uh, the parties in a deposition, helps a jury. And step five is your call to action or as, a, as an expert witness, your final opinion premised upon that particular question. You can take 30 seconds and do this or you can take 30 minutes to do this, okay? But if you understand the steps, state the problem, agitate the problem, state the conclusion, show how the conclusion satisfies the needs, wants, and desires of your audience, and number five, some type of call to action. In my closing arguments, this is what I do, and my call to action is to bring up a jury verdict and fill it out in front of the jury and show them exactly what I want to put in there. You can use those same five steps oftentimes in sharing your expert opinion. That's this is high level stuff that works really, really well, you guys. The more you do it, the more comfortable you get with it. The other thing I would do is when it comes to communication, uh, a friend of mine, Car Carmine Gallo, wrote the book, Talk Like Ted. And what Carmine did is he interviewed 200 TED speakers, the top TED speakers, and what makes them great TED talk speakers. Mm -hmm. And Carmine broke down what each of these top TED speakers had in common. And there's some things we already talked about. They used emotion. 
They were unique. They created memorable content. You know what else they did? They kept things short and sweet, 18 minutes or less. They did their PowerPoints a certain way. They did their presentations a certain way. I would encourage everyone, you know, get Talk Like Ted and dive into and tap into how these TED speakers present themselves because you'll be able to incorporate their approaches and techniques in your next deposition, in your next trial. I'm not talking about communicating in a fake way or in a way that you're not comfortable with doing. What I'm talking about is getting better at simply answering questions and by looking at these resources, you're going to pick up something that's going to, it's going to ring the bell and you're going to go, that's what I need to do. Why didn't I do that last week when I gave deposition testimony? Another technique that works really well, especially for expert witnesses, is to use metaphors. Okay, it's one thing to say, and by the way, you guys, today is the first day of April and April is Distracted Driving Awareness Month. A lot of you know I'm a, I'm a big time advocate to help raise awareness as to the dangers of distracted driving. What a lot of people don't know is that 6,000 people a year are killed by distracted driving. It's a terrible number, right? It's, it's a terrible number. I can tell you 6,000 people a year are killed by distracted driving, or I can use a metaphor. And when I'm having this conversation, I could say something like, did you know that the number of people killed in the United States each year by distracted driving is the equivalent of a Boeing 747 holding 500 passengers crashing every two hours for the next 24 hours? I used a metaphor to show just how high these numbers are. Metaphors are like candy for the mind, right? And yeah. it, they just resonate with opposing counsel, yeah. with opposing counsel's client, with a jury when that jury goes back into the deliberation room. Listen, they're not going to know the number or the fact that you testified to from the, from the witness stand, but they're going to remember that metaphor. What did Mitch say about those 747 crashes? And then another juror is going to step in and start talking about that. Or after a deposition, they're going to go back to the other side's law firm and they're going to talk about the different metaphors uh, that you use to make your point. Metaphors are gold. They help you solidify the point you're trying to make. To learn how to, how to create and use metaphors in an effective fashion, I highly recommend Ann Miller. That's A-N-N-E Miller.com. Okay. She wrote the book, The Tall Lady with the Iceberg. She wrote the book, What You Make what you say pay. And she wrote the book, Metaphorically Selling. Ann Miller helped me when the facts in the case were a little bit different than what we thought the evidence was going to show because of rulings and arguments and expert testimony. So I was getting ready the night before for my closing argument on a case. And I reached out to Ann. I said, Ann, this is what's going on. Can you help me come up with a metaphor for tomorrow's closing argument? And she wrote about this at her blog. And what she did is about an hour later, she came back to me and said, Mitch, what, that other side, what the other side's doing is they're playing Russian roulette, roulette with your client's life. They're spinning the chamber and pulling the trigger and hoping the bullet doesn't go off. And that was the metaphor that I incorporated into my closing argument the next day, which helped us win the case and the jurors afterwards, because we can talk to them in the hallways. I don't know if you guys know that said that my closing argument and that metaphor crystallized the issues and facts. That's what they talked about back in the jury deliberation room. And, uh, and that's why the power of metaphor is so strong when it comes to communication. So the first two of our seven tips that we talked about are people skills and communication skills. And those are some of the best resources that I found that allow you to do all of the above. And we're getting several questions about the resources that you've that you've uh, asked so far. So the first one was the for the book, uh, the adversaries and the allies. the The author is Bob Berg, B U R G. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter. He's a very engaging person. Um, the next item, uh, Guy Kawasaki, is, last name is spelled. Uh, I believe K A W A S A K A K I, correct? correct? Correct. Okay, so if you had, uh, and 
then the next question was Carmine who, who did the uh, TED? Gallo, Carmine Gallo, G-A-L-L-O, gifted writer, gifted author, talk like TED. And, and that's a book by him or a video? It's a best-selling book, maybe a New York Times best-selling book, if I'm not mistaken. It's, it's just so powerful for really anyone in business, any professional, and especially experts and lawyers. Excellent. Excellent. So that's uh, in case you guys missed some of those. Uh, I wanted to reiterate that again, we will be, we will be having this replay available uh, afterwards. So if you missed anything, uh, we'll have the YouTube link and it'll be emailed to you so you can go through it and, and recatch everything. So if you haven't, uh, I see that we have a lot of those questions. Shelly asks, is there a participant cap? Uh, we've, because of, 500 person cap. I've got well over 500 here right now. So I uh, do not believe that my cap is, uh, is stopping people. We're well over 500. Uh, if, you're, yeah. uh, if your friend is registered, they will get a copy of the replay regardless. So they'll be able to uh, follow up with this. So uh, we are well over 500 people and lots of questions. And with that, Mitch, I'm just going to we're 30 minutes all in already yeah. and we're on to step three. So I'm going to let you go ahead and keep rolling. If you, did you have a Sounds second good. to drink a little water? I did. I had a little okay. coffee. So I appreciate that. It's still uh, 1130 here on the West coast. So one of, one of the incentives of me doing this, Nick, is the better experts are of sharing their opinions in an effective, persuasive, believable, accurate way, way the better it is for all of us. It makes our system work better, you guys. I'm at the point in my career where I really want to build the brand of lawyers and trial lawyers with the general consumer. I happen to know we make a difference. We make the world a better place. The better we are, the better our experts are, the better it is for society right now. And so that's really my, my incentive for doing this. And so what we're doing is we're diving into seven tips every expert should understand and appreciate and do during depositions and trials. Their first tip was to, to practice good people skills. The second tip was to work on your communication skills. The third tip is to work on how you come across as a professional when you're telling during a deposition, arbitration, mediation, or trial. In other words, are you lecturing? Are you instructing like a college professor? Are you speaking down to the lawyer, to the jury, to the judge, to anyone else that will listen to you? Or are you sharing from your heart knowledge, wisdom, a, an opinion based on X amount of years of doing what you do in a way where you're helping everyone find the truth in the case, where you're that leader in the courtroom that's helping everyone come to the right conclusion in the case. This is the mindset that the best experts I've hired, the best experts I've watched, and the best experts I've read about and studied bring into a deposition and into a trial. They're there to help, okay? And they're there to help everyone reach the right decision. Now, let's take a step back. The reality is most of you are being hired by one side who are looking for one particular outcome. And obviously the other side, either with good cause or maybe not so much, are looking for another outcome with their expert. I get that, okay? I'm not a naive trial lawyer. What I'm telling you is that if you want to help your client or the law firm that hired you get the results that you want, you want to come in with <clears throat> the mindset of being that professional who's there to listen, to help and to guide everyone to the right answer, the right solution and the right outcome. And that has to do with how you handle yourself, your people skills, the communication skills, your body language, all the above. It's how you interact with everyone else. One of the cases I had, the jury came back and after our trials, you guys, we can go out into the hall, hall and talk to our jurors about, you know, what can we do to, to, to actually create better experience for the jurors in our next trial. Funny thing with me is, Jurors will tell me, okay, Mr. Jackson, you need to slow down. You talk too fast during trial. Guess what I do during the next trial? I slow down. I go and come outside, talk to the jurors. Mr. Jackson, you need to speed up. You're talking too slow. I get that, right? So you want the feedback and you want to just kind of 
continue to evolve as a lawyer or an expert witness. One of the uh, cases we walked out and the, jur the jury talked to us about how the other side's expert was demeaning, condescending, uh, talking down, they felt to the judge, not necessarily to the jury, but to the judge when the judge would try to get the expert to stay on topic, um, as opposed to our expert who actually was a professor at a major university in Los Angeles teaching a first year class, mm -hmm. not using complicated words, but making his point, uh, using metaphors, using some of the techniques that we've talked about, because by the way, these are seven things that I go through with my experts. Okay, I'm not focused on, by the time we hire them, they're qualified. I wanna make sure they satisfy these other seven steps. Right. So because of how he handled himself and he was confident and uh, courteous to everyone in the courtroom and helpful and useful, that helped us win that case. So that's number three on the tips. Number four on the tips has to do with your retainer agreements, your price, your terms, the conditions of how you're being retained. And you got. And I want to stop you there before you sure. jump into number four, because you said something that I'm always trying to drive home for my members, my customers at experts.com, when I tell them to put together a case study of their expert with, uh, of their expertise, I always say, think about how you're writing it to educate that first year freshman college audience. I think that's an important way to take all that knowledge that an expert has and put it into something that can be understood by just about everybody. It, it's, it's case and fact and issue dependent. It depends right. on you know how complicated the case is and, and the point that expert's being retained to make. But yes, generally speaking, you want to keep things simple, especially when you're speaking in front during a deposition or trial. It may be different than the report that you write. Right. Just because you write a detailed right. report doesn't mean you need to come across that way from the witness stand. Right. A lot of questions I'm seeing, Nick, uh, just real quick before I pivot to retainer agreements and price and terms, has to do with what's happening in a deposition. Being asked that question, you don't want to ask, you don't want to answer, or you don't think you need to answer. And I just glanced at these quickly, Nick, and just real quick, everyone, it's the attorney who hires you, okay, to bring you into a deposition because you're offering expert testimony. It's your attorney's obligation to object to inappropriate questions. It's not your obligation. So what you want to do is if if you're in deposition and you know, at the first level, if your attorney does not object to a question under oath and required to answer that question, that's the bottom line. So you want to work with your attorney before you go into the deposition uh, as to what questions you're not comfortable with answering or what questions, if asked, would violate the code of civil procedure or the evidence code of your state or federal jurisdiction. And by the way, any advice that I'm giving when it comes to legal stuff, evidence code, civil procedure, it's not legal advice. We're just having a conversation on licensed in California, so no legal is being given. But I see this same question being asked, and, and you have to understand in a deposition, when you raise your hand and you swear to tell the truth or give an oath, it's up to your lawyer to make the objections. And if he or she doesn't object, then technically you're required to answer the question. Having said that, if you're asked a question that you're uncomfortable with, you can take a break. Will it reflect well on your testimony? Will the attorney comment on the break that you took during trial? Maybe. But if you do it the right way, and we can talk about this later, Nick, you sure. can step up and talk to the attorney off the record about why you're uncomfortable answering this personal question that maybe has to do with your tax returns or maybe has to do with your physical or mental health. There are some things that actually are off limits but generally speaking, if I'm sitting in a deposition with my expert next to me and one of those questions are asked, I'm not leaving it up to the expert to refuse to answer the question. I am as that expert's attorney. So take the pressure off of you and put it on you, the lawyer that hires you to do their job at a deposition. Along those same lines, retainer agreements. All experts should have written expert retainer agreements with the lawyer or company that hires you. Okay, it's critically important until you have that signed retainer agreement, 
don't do the work. Don't volunteer unless you know the person and you want to help them out. And there's another reason you're marketing, you're branding, you're building your brand. Generally speaking, take care of that agreement right off the bat. Lawyers understand the necessity of having a written retainer agreement. And I guarantee you when it comes to their clients, mm -hmm. we make sure we have that retainer agreement before we put in any work and, and, and do anything on the file. State bar rules require this and so do sentence rules of business and ethics. You need to do the same thing. Any experts that are putting hours and hours of their time uh, expecting to be paid for their research, putting together, and they reach out to me because they're not getting, they don't have a written retainer agreement. So that's number one. Number two, make sure your written retainer agreements are straightforward, cover all the contingencies, are easy to understand for not only the lawyer to read, but his or her, or her client to go through and understand. And here's the key thing. In some states and some jurisdictions, we can take the other side's retainer agreement and blow it up and use it as an, a jury exhibit. It just depends. So you wanna make sure your retainer agreements are written in a way where if they're ever discussed, blown up, shared with opposing counsel or in front of a jury, you're gonna be okay. In other words, in that retainer, I am here to offer my objective expert opinion on the following issues. Uh, and so that everyone knows I will only testify as to facts, circumstances, and evidence that I believe is forthright, truthful, and uh, requires no speculation. For example, imagine that type of language in a retainer agreement that's blown up in front of a jury and the other side is trying to use your retainer agreement to impeach you or make you look bad, maybe because of what you charge per hour or what you charge per project your attorney is going to be able to come back and highlight that and say, listen, we've got a professional here who from day one made it clear that he or she was only going to be testifying as to the truth or only as to the facts as, you know, as indicated in this case. Critically important to have a well-written uh, retainer agreement. You just want to get everything in writing. It avoids headaches down, down the uh, path. The fifth tip I want to dive into, Nick, but we can go back if you have any questions. Yeah, I do. has to do with being reliable, being a reliable expert and taking the initiative and, and, and helping the lawyer or law firm that hires you uh, take them by the hand and show them what you need to do. But we can go back to retainer agreements if you want. Yeah, like. and I want you, to, <laughs> I, I want you to have a second to have a drink of water because we're sharing a ton of information here, folks. Uh, we will, this replay will be available for those who are asking about the resources that Mitch is talking about. I'm going to have him email me the list of the resources after we're done because uh, it looks like he's got it all written down. And so then I will in, we will include that in the follow-up email in the next uh, seven to 10 days with the replay for you. Uh, so you don't have to write down all those. Focus on what he's discussing here today. Uh, and we will provide you with, with all the resources in the email. Um, Mitch, your your comment about the retainer agreement is really interesting because what you have recommended, assuming that it could possibly be blown up as an exhibit, rolls right into your next topic, does it not? About your reliability, your credibility, those types of issues. It does. So, so your retainer agreement should be part of your credibility as an expert witness and talk about your objectivity. Have, have a professionally drafted re retainer agreement from day one. As a lawyer, I respect experts who, Mitch, I can help you on this case. I understand the facts. Um, send over, <clears throat> let me send the retainer agreement over to you, sign it, get it back to me, and let's take care of business. I respect that, but most experts don't do that. Okay, they, they get into hours and hours of work and then they wonder why they're not being paid. In your retainer agreements, real quick, you guys, have a venue clause. That venue clause is basically a provision that says anything, any disputes, any claims, any litigations that may arise out of this retainer agreement will be handled in the city of X, county of Y, state of Z. That way, for example, my venue clauses are Orange County, California. If the other side, if the lawyer who hires you is playing games about paying your fee, and he's in Arizona and you're in California, then California, Orange County, California, Santa Ana would be the venue. It helps you have leverage to get paid. Critically important, have indemnification 
uh, clauses in your retainer agreement, which means if there's a malpractice suit after the fact, somebody doesn't like the verdict, something bad happens, it has nothing to do with you, and you get dragged into the case as a named defendant, that indemnification clause signed by the law firm that hired you uh, is there to protect you and reimburse you for any damages. And it's their obligation to provide you with legal counsel. These are the types of provisions that you can have in your expert retainer agreements that a lot of experts don't have. Mm -hmm. In addition to a few other provisions that will just, hopefully you'll never need to use them. Hopefully by having them, it will avoid issues from coming, from popping up. But when you do need these provisions to apply five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, you know, um, it'll be nice to have them there. So just kind of keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, and I, Mitch, I want to run this poll again because there have sure. been some questions. Uh, so I'm going to relaunch the poll. Uh, uh, if you answered it already, please answer, uh, please answer it again. I want to take this uh, a second here for, to answer a few questions. We are not providing retainer agreements, so I think you should talk to your own counsel about that. Yeah, uh, each state's different. Each, state's each state different. is different. We are not going to be providing templates for that. Uh, we will be telling you about uh, all the resources that Mitch has, has, uh, has provided in this. Uh, please take a look at the poll and please answer the poll. We're just taking a little minute here. I'm going to take a drink. We've just got a couple more items uh, that we're going to process. I'm going through the questions as we go. After after that, uh, at about noon, I think uh, you think we got will be finished up at, by noon, Mitch. Yeah, I do so, because I think tips five and six we can breeze through, and then we have a bonus tip we're going to talk about. We do which have is a totally bonus, relevant, which is probably one of the more important things we're going to be talking about. So. We do have a bonus tip, and make sure to stick around for those of you who are interested in marketing your expertise. We'll be offering something special for you at the end, uh, so that you'll you'll stick around for my call to action. But please uh, go ahead. Uh, I will publish the results of this poll. People are interested to see how others have, uh, how much deposition experience others have had. Um, and, and then we will do a, a pretty significant Q&A. Mitch is not up against a hard timeline and, and I have about another uh, 45 minutes to an hour free. So uh, Ooh, Nick's enjoying this. He went from 30 minutes it. to another. So, so here's the thing, you guys, uh, we talked about personality and people skills, number two, communication skills, number three, professionalism, number four, retainers, price rate terms, and some things you want to think about. The last two, and I'm just going to combine these two because I want to do Q&A. Number five is being reliable and taking the initiative on these cases. Oftentimes, lawyers, when we hire experts, sure, what, we, what documents we need, what evidence we need to show, what steps we need to take uh, to help you share the opinion that we want you to share. And so what you need to understand is be that expert that is offering, look, Mitch, you need one, two, three, four, and five in order for me to do my job. This document, this witness, this piece of evidence, this admission, work with, take the initiative and work with the law firm or the lawyer who's hiring you to make sure they know what they need to do during discovery, maybe asking their client a question over the phone, really simple things so that we can cross off our list for you what needs to be done taking the initiative is huge we're working on other things at the law firm okay we feel like we've handed you the ball to run with it on these on the expert issue on the expert opinion and i love it when experts actually don't waste my time and take the initiative to do what they need to do but then reach out to me with a text or an email or a phone call Okay, short, quick, concise, respect the time and attention or limited time and attention. All of us have in today's world, don't spend 30 minutes on the phone with a lawyer on a 30 second question. Trust me on the, about this. I'll remember the fact that you respected my time and I'll do the same with you. And we can focus on making sure that you come across as the best expert, not only in the case, but by the time we're done, um, the best expert available so that other lawyers see your results. Okay. This is the way it works. We look and we see which experts in court are doing the things that we're talking about. And frankly, if you're not, 
I'm not, we're not going to hire you, but if you are, your name gets circulated. We go into our databases, we go to experts.com, we find the lawyers, that, the experts that understand this, or we talk to other lawyers, who is the expert that you used in that case? Quick example, I had a wrongful death drowning case here at Lake Mission Viejo, California, and we hire, we hired, we consulted and interviewed with the top lifeguard expert in the state of California, okay? Mm-hmm tops in California, as far as training on the job, still a lifeguard, managed all the lifeguards. Um, he had a conflict with one of the lifeguards at the lake who dropped the ball. Okay. And because of that conflict, he said, you know, I'm just not comfortable with, with handling this case. And I said, well, I get that. Who would you recommend? Who's the best expert in the country? And he gave me the name of a lifeguard expert, uh, Frank Pia out of New York. Now we're in California, but we hired Frank and a year went by, discovery, depots. Frank flew out to California a couple of times. It was an expensive case to litigate, but uh, we ended up winning the case because of Frank. We settled the case, but here's what happened. When I took the other side's expert's deposition, guess who they hired here in California to be their expert? The same gentleman I spoke to a year and a half earlier. And he talked to them about that. And they said, that's fine. Mr. Jackson's firm didn't hire you. We're, we want to hire you. And they shouldn't have done that. That was a mistake. They shouldn't have. But when I had him in a deposition, we we're talking. And I said, is this the first time you and I have, have talked? I talked to him over the phone. He said, he looked at me and he goes, no. He knew where I was going. I said, mm -hmm. when, when, when's the first time we talked? About a year and a half ago. And I said, do you remember what we talked about? So we relived using the techniques I'm sharing with you guys, emotion, storytelling, that conversation. And I said, and who did you recommend to me as being the top lifeguard expert in the country? <laughs> he goes, your expert, Frank Pia. Right. We settled the case that afternoon. Interesting. Seven figure case, true story. So the point is you guys is uh, as an expert, when I say being reliable, and number seven is being honest and upfront and no surprises. Don't compromise getting a new expert retention job as an expert, okay? While at the same time, potentially placing your client or law firm at risk for what happened in this case. Now, it was probably inadvertent. Um, you know, there's a lot of content and information going around. It's hard to keep track of conflict checks, but I'm telling you guys, if you have a negative in your background, if something's happened where you're being asked to testify by me, I'm reaching out to you and you're being asked to testify to something that you've testified just the contrary to in your last five trials, or maybe in one case 10 years ago, that because of new science, because of new facts, because of a new approach, you feel different about it. Mm -hmm. You need to be upfront with the law firm and talk to them about that. I can deal with those changes in technology and science. I can't deal with any lack of information, any misinformation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. pay attention to being reliable and helpful, which is number five. And then number six, uh, staying honest and being upfront regarding any issues, any challenges. Once you get into a case, and if you find that maybe the facts or your opinion isn't what you and the attorney who's hired you originally thought you were going to be testifying about, you need to have a conversation with that attorney. Here's what you do. At least in California, the conversation is, Mitch, I need to speak with you about the XYZ case. Mm -hmm. Is our conversation protected under attorney-client privilege, under attorney work product, yes or no? And I'll share an answer to that question. Depending on the answer to that question will dictate what we do next. Because if it turns out that experts, the opinion I'm seeking from that expert is one that he or she is not comfortable with giving because of science. And I get mm -hmm. that. Maybe I need to go out and hire another expert to come into the case and bring a motion and bring a new expert in. Maybe it's an issue where there's a conflict where that expert's realizing that 10 years ago, he or she was an expert for opposing counsel and didn't disclose it. Mm -hmm. I mean, whatever the issue is, you guys, be upfront because as trial lawyers, we're going to remember that. We're, we're going to, uh, the good part about that, being right. upfront. And, um, and it's something we can normally deal with nine out of 10 times. It's when 
It's when something isn't brought to our attention before a deposition or as we're walking into a deposition or as we're walking into a trial, hey, Mitch, there's something I need to tell you. That's where we have a problem. Right. Okay, so, so, so just to kind of go through these seven tips real quick before we get to our bonus tip, which I think is huge right now, especially right. with what's going on around the world, is, you know, obviously you're only taking uh, cases where you're qualified and you have the credentials to be an expert. That's a gimme, okay? Mm -hmm. Next level, number one, people skills, number two, communication skills, number three, how you act as a professional, number four, your retainer agreement, price, terms, and conditions, number five, being reliable, being helpful, making a difference in the case, making my job easier. And number six, being honest and upfront and not creating a scenario where there are any unpleasant surprises. Those are seven tips that lead us. Oh, to actually, you hit us on number six. Did you c combine five and six there? I, I, I guess did. I, okay. I did because I, yeah. they're simple, straightforward. I think it makes sense to everybody. And I want to make sure we have time for our bonus topic and Q&A because there's a Perfect. lot of questions. I see 78 questions in the chat. Yeah, there's a lot of questions here. I'm going to share the poll results uh, one more time for folks just to see how other experts are doing while I'm sharing these poll results, I'm going to beg you all, what, what often happens is we bring in an attorney, have them as a guest, and then everybody will go and send their CV or call them and say that they can work for them. I Please do not concentrate on the people skills and the communication yeah. skills and don't go and, and pitch our, blindly pitch our guest. We would greatly appreciate that. Uh, and uh, so you can now see uh, those, those uh, poll results. Uh, about 6% have never been deposed and, and most people are in the one to 10 times, which means you're, that's good. That's good. Yeah. And, and then we have 13% over 50 times. So a good, uh, a, a good, uh, good group of, of experts with a variety of uh, experience here. So Mitch, what is our bonus tip? And I think you have a little well, special something that you have started that kind of oh. goes hand in hand with this bonus tip. So what is right. right. So first of all, let me just share the fact that I just combined tips five and six and I did that on the fly. I did that to accommodate what we're doing here, um, which kind of goes back to what we're talking about today. Be flexible. You guys, you know, always adjust your opinions and adjust your testimony and adjust how you're doing things with what's going on right? I don't need to spend 20 minutes on number five and six. I consolidated it so that we can handle the 83 questions in chat and the other several dozen uh, that Nick sent over, was kind enough to send over before we went live. The point is, is uh, these things work. And here's the deal right now. Um, we're talking business. We're talking uh, different ways to help you be a better and more effective expert witness to get on my radar and the radar of all the good trial lawyers across the country um, in a time right now where we have, you know, just a devastating, tragic health and safety COVID-19 issue that's affecting all of us. And, and a lot of us, it's affecting us personally. And I get that. This webinar is about the business side of what we're talking about. All right. So I don't want to minimize anything we're talking about. But one of the things that I've noticed, we went into the cloud, Nick, about 10 years ago, the law mm -hmm. firm. Everything we do is cloud-based CRM and, and video and live video. And, you know, I've been on videos uh, in the past just because I embraced this technology early. Really cool, you guys, with people like Katie Kirk, uh, Anderson Cooper, uh, Peter Diamandis, just some really amazing individuals and human beings because of, of video. I think I met Nick originally because of live video. Yep. And so I think what we're realizing over the last couple of weeks in the business world is how powerful live video is, especially when it comes to no contact requirements or concerns when it comes to social distancing, when it comes to convenience. I'm seeing a permanent pivot in the business world where how we used to allow our time and attention to be wasted by unnecessary travel, by unnecessary meetings, we can now do with live video. And I think as an expert witness, if you position yourself to be able to talk to lawyers via live video, to consult via live video, 
it will help you build your, your expert witness practices. It will help you build your brand because you're being useful. You're thinking about your audience and it's never been more effective, more recognized, more accepted than it is this week. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we did that you're more than welcome to model, and I think it would be very easy to model is we've always done mediations. I like being a mediator, not so much an arbitrator, but a mediator. And what we did over the weekend is we created mediationlawyer.live. And all we're doing is we're allowing mediations because our courts have been canceled, stopped, or stayed. Nothing's happening in our court system right now in California, except emergency procedures. Our mediation and arbitration services, physical hearings have all been taken off calendar. So what we decided to do is offer our services as mediators via live video, just like this where we've got uh, the parties, the attorneys able to be in his or her office or even better, their home. The client can be in his or her home. The insurance adjuster from New York can stay in New York. I can handle the mediation from my office or at home. And we can do mediations using live video. And I can tell you when I've reached out to law firms and say, listen, your cases are stayed, your mediations are canceled. You're looking for an opportunity to mediate. How about live video? A lot of the lawyers weren't even aware that they could do this from their home. They thought they had to get in the car and drive down to a deposition service, stand in front of a bunch of expensive equipment and do the mediation that way via live video. Not the case. There are services out there like the one we're using today, Zoom, that allow you to have a real-time consultation, right? A real-time interaction with clients and attorneys. Uh, combining this with services like DocuSign, where you can electronically send and get your retainer agreements signed by the attorney that's hiring you in literally 30 seconds. Uh, super fast, where you can exchange documents, large files using Dropbox or, or Google Drive with opposing counsel, videos, exhibits, whatever it might be with the attorney that's hiring you take advantage of technology in today's world and brand yourself as that live video expert. And I think what's going to happen is you're going to see your demand substantially increase because I can't go to court right now. I can't mediate a case right now, but I can meet with you on live video. And if I need an expert for a case that I'm hoping will go to trial in November of this year, how are we going to meet? How am I going to meet you? I want to see how you look, how you come across, how you sound, how you handle yourself. And guess what? That trial in November just might be resolved by a live video, video mediation. So I want to see how you come across on video. This is the time to embrace this technology and take things to the next level. Combine the six or seven things that we talked about with how you come across on live video. And I think there's the upside potential is unlimited. Yep. Excellent. And where can they go and see this new site that you just created over the weekend? Right, for right. The arbitration it's, or for the mediation services. So it's, it's mediationlawyer.live. And all we did, you guys, is we set up a domain. We happen to use GoDaddy, set the domain up, in fact, four or five domains similar to that. And then we went to a service and just created a quick and expensive website. I had my front office help me with that. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you go to mediationlawyer.live, think to yourself, how can I do the same thing with a website that's only four or five pages and uh, start sharing this with all the lawyers, with all the companies to hire me as an expert witness? How right. can I put this on their radar? We also, Nick, went to our uh, law firm front page, homepage, and towards the top, we changed some of the language to invite and let the consumer know that we offer live video consultations. We respect the no contact social distancing challenge that we're all facing today. So we can meet by live video. All you need to click, do is click and we can have a conversation and it really has made a difference. So take advantage of this opportunity to create an exemplary client experience. Your clients are the lawyers who hire you, the companies that hire you and don't fight this technology, embrace it, learn it. And then once you tap into these tools, use the seven approaches that we talked about to come across the right way on these tools. 
I and mean, yep, perfect. And as a follow up to that, we're working on facilitating these video chats and calendaring on experts.com as an alternative. We don't yet have a date for rolling out yet, but we understand that some experts I want like this available. Mitch and I actually talked about it yesterday. Uh, the video technology may be challenging even for experts. So we are working to incorporate that. And this really goes into those people of you- are, Nick, people are listening. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just want you guys to know with the inexpensive technology out there today, when 34 people, 34 people just went to the website. I get notified you guys when people come to the website. So that's how quickly this works, but I didn't mean to inter interrupt you. That's, sorry, no, sorry. it's good. To, good the technology for them to know. is amazing, right? It's amazing. And we've got, we're just about to jump into the actual Q and a. So I see that they're piling up and actually good. Mitch covered uh, one of the Q and a, I want to say anybody who's attending and registered for this video, we are offering a membership discount for experts.com. Uh, it's a 30% discount for this webinar only for those in attendance, those who have registered 30% discount. Uh, the discount code will be Mitch, M-I-T-C-H three zero, Mitch 30. It's a new members only discount. Uh, so if you're an existing okay. member, it does not apply for new members only. And it expires on April 30th, uh, the end of this month. It is our uh, new member discount for the month that we're all kind of stuck here. <laughs> we're hey, all stuck doing remote. We are, but I'm, I'm enjoying doing remote, to be honest with you. I, I think I'm more efficient using this technology. And I will say, Nick, listening to what you're saying, those experts that are visiting our site right now, which by the way, you guys, our, our primary site's jacksonandwilson.com. That's the traditional law firm website. Mm -hmm. We also have streaming.lawyer, which is a video blog I set up about eight years ago, just to kind of complement some of these other things that have nothing to do with practicing law. But a lot of things Nick and I are talking about, we have at streaming.lawyer. And the reason I'm bringing it up, Nick, is the most recent post has four or five blog posts and links to how to do Zoom and live video the right way. Right. So I think your experts that are like, I get this. I want to learn how to be on live video and use my hands and have a green screen background and, and whatever it might be. Those links, that's everything you need to know over at streaming.lawyer. What you guys are clicking to at mediationlawyer.live is something we put up just last weekend. Yep. I'm working out on a Saturday morning. I'm thinking I'm tired of these mediations being canceled, my mediations. And I'm thinking, wait a minute why don't I embrace live video? And by Monday morning, we were up and running. So you guys can do the same thing. Reach out to me if you have any questions. Nick, anyone that sets up a live video consulting option like what we've done, what I would recommend, and they're already your members, I would go back to my member profile and someplace in that profile, I would include a link to the new blog, oh, or to the new webpage and say, we offer live video consultations, click here and send them over which is what I talked to Mitch about, adding the link to his new site on his experts.com profile. Good. And here is our first question. Do you see the question from Linda? Uh, I do not. But oh, you don't. Okay. So but, uh, her question, I'll, I'll ask it. She says, remote work. Is this going to be a new normal for experts? I, mean, I think so. Sort of oh, touched you know, on it. So I'm looking at it right now and the answer, absolutely. There's a major business pivot taking place right now. Uh, because of necessity. And I think everyone is, is appreciating the power of video, the power of cloud, the power of using technology to focus on creating a better client experience. That's what it's all about. It's not about what's easiest for you. It's not about automating human relationships. It's about what can I do to satisfy the client's experience. And that means everything we do, you guys, needs to be mobile responsive. Everything we do, your lawyers and clients need to be able to access on their smart device. A tap and swipe is all it should take for someone to be able to go to your website. So when you're creating this, this content, create it on a mobile responsive website and make the consumer or end user's experience as good as possible. And uh, Linda asked another question and, and I am going to uh, push, push this one out. Some folks do not have good video experience recording and appearing on camera. How can you help? Mitch, we may have to do a follow-up. 
uh, we may have to do a follow-up webinar because you and I let's, have some experience on this. Yeah, but uh, let's we, say I want to answer these questions. Streaming.lawyer, my most recent blog post has four or five uh, links you can go to right now. So by six o'clock tonight, you will be further ahead than 99.99% of all the experts in the United States and on the planet when it comes to live video. That's how fast you can get up to speed on this stuff. You just got to take the time to digest that information. Problem solved. Seriously, I just want to, let's just go through these questions and okay. I want to answer them. All right. Uh, if that's okay see. with you. That's fine with that's me. That's the answer. That's the answer. This is here. It's not complicated stuff. Look at the links and put it to use. All right. Uh, recently during uh, depo, opposing counsel asked me questions about documents and recorded phone calls, which counsel who engaged me had not shared with me. Obviously, I couldn't answer. What would you recommend I do say to the attorney who engaged me? If you're asked any question that you either are uncomfortable with answering or you're not sure how to answer that question, it's perfectly all right to use the skills that we talked about and look at the attorney in the eye who asked you the question. That's a good question. Do you mind if I take a break and talk to Mr. Jones or Mrs. Smith, the attorney who hired you, uh, before answering the question? That's going to alert the attorney sitting next to you that there's something going on and that he or she needs to take a break. The attorney can take a break anytime he or she wants. We don't need opposing counsel's permission. We don't work for them. They may not like it. They may argue they're going to talk about that in front of the jury six months from now when we go to trial doesn't matter. A good lawyer can deal with that. So speak to the attorney if any challenges come up, and that applies to a lot of depot questions. It's not up to you as the expert to determine what's an appropriate answer. It's up to the lawyer who hired you. Yes, uh, great. So let's see, we have Martin who says his biggest question is how to best market himself as an expert to attorneys nationwide or otherwise to pick up new opportunities. Ooh. Experts.com. <laughs> yeah, ex experts.com, okay, as far as, and that's why I'm there. I've got a couple of different listings, uh, both for the law firm and as a consulting expert, but I'm glad that Martin asked that question because there were two resources I didn't talk about, and they fall into this category. You guys, there's a, you don't want to market, okay? What you want to do is build relationships. Seriously, you want to build relationships and build your brand as being that go-to expert uh, that once you're hired, you're going to get the job done. There's a new mindset when it comes to building relationships. Marketing, yes, we're marketing, but I like to think of it as relationships because it's all about the mindset. So there's two resources I want to share with you guys. One is this new book, Fanocracy by David Merriman Scott. David's a gentleman. He's a marketing expert. Guy's brilliant, super nice guy. I met him through my daughter. Long story. But David's the gentleman that's got me on stage the last couple of years at Tony Robbins. Okay, he's brilliant. This book talks about creating raving fans, about having other lawyers and other experts talk about how good you are, how honest you are, how efficient you are, how effective you are, and it gives you the tools to do just that. Another great book out there about marketing and about branding I think would help every expert watching the show is Mark Schaefer's latest book. It's called Marketing Rebellion, The Most Human Company Wins. So I'm talking about fans, I'm talking human. You guys take the content in David and Mark's books, apply that to the description and the listing that you have at experts.com, incorporate these approaches into that initial incoming email, incoming phone call, incoming text message, and you're gonna close more deals, you're gonna build your brand, you're gonna be setting yourself up for long-term success. If you don't mind, Nick, because I walk my talk, Sure. Okay. So you yeah. guys, I, so here's what I did. I reached out to 46 other top experts around the world. Nick is one of them. Nick is a contributing author in this book. So when I say this is a great book, it's because I got 46 other top experts to contribute. And this book is in three sections. The first section is understanding the mindset of today's business owner, what we've just talked about. If you don't understand the mindset, none of this is going to work. Number two, understanding the personalities of the social media platforms. Number three, and this is what I'm getting to, 15 plus chapters on how to communicate. Whether you're marketing, whether you're building relationships, you're building your brand. Carmine Gallo, Nick Rishwain, Bob Berg, a lot of it, Mark Schaefer, they've all contributed chapters to this book. This information right here, 
I wrote the book, you guys, and every single day I'm learning. Every single yep. day I see something new that I want to add to my, my uh, you know, into my tools. And yep. so even I'm constantly working on this stuff. Let's go back to Q&A. Sorry Const about that. Constantly working on this stuff. I get excited about this because I love building, doing this stuff, you guys. It's about building that internet persona. So it's yeah. your website, it's your experts.com link, it's your social media, all linking back to each other. This is what Mitch and I do all the time. This one's, uh, this one's great. It's not really a question, but Jerry says, courts may be closed, but attorneys seem to be working away. Today is Wednesday and I've gotten two new cases this week. And that's the experience we're yeah. having, Mitch. Most of, them are going, most of them are going uh, remote and, and working. So Steve. let's talk, but let's also talk about, listen, the reality is you guys, right now um, with everything that's happening and it's devastating, I lived through 1987, Black Monday, okay? I've been through that and, and I watched who came out on the other end of it and I can comfortably tell you, life goes on all right it's the people that keep doing what they're good at doing to get through these tragedies get to get through these these situations these business challenges in 1999 and 2000 you guys uh my firm's up and running full speed and then the market crashed i get it companies were going out of business all i can tell you is that it was a little hiccup in a journey through life same thing happened in 2008 with the financial crisis in the real estate market and now with what's happening now, the sun's going to come up tomorrow. People are going to have legal challenges because of all of the disruption that's happening right now. They're going to need lawyers. They're going to need experts. This is the time to raise the bar and build your brand. This isn't the time to back off or um, disappear. And when I say raise the bar, I'm talking about being helpful and useful. I'm not talking about marketing and hardcore stuff. I'm like, this is what we do. How can we help you? So Nick, let's go through some more Q&A. Right here. Uh, can you provide video deposition under oath? That's a state and federal specific question. And generally speaking, the answer is all the time. Excellent. Talk to a lawyer uh, for, for more information in your state. And let's see. How often yeah. do you use your expert as an advisor at the deposition of the opposing expert or other opposing witnesses? All the time. However, it's usually before we go into the deposition. By the time I show up for deposition, I'm ready to rock and roll. So I'll have looked at the other expert's report. We'll know what he or she's going to testify to. I'll go over that with our expert. Um, talk about what do we want to reveal, what, what soft points or weak points in their case do I even want to bring up to the at the deposition or do I, do I want to save that for mediation or trial? We do not put all our cards on the table during depositions. It's a poker game. I'm not in there to win the depo. I'm in there, in there to set the case up so I can bring it home during trial. Excellent. And experts need to remember that. Excellent. Should an expert retainer agreement be with the lawyer, the company being sued, or their insurance carrier as responsible for payments to the expert? It's going to come down to who's, who's retaining you. I would suggest that if the lawyer is reaching out to retain you, <clears throat> there are attorney-client and attorney work product privileges that, that allow for a level of um, necessary confidentiality and legal confidentiality, which is different in each state. So normally, as the law firm, will be the uh, entity retaining the expert witness so that he or she's opinions, thoughts, and consultations fall under that confidentiality provision. Also, each state has different discovery rules and regulations, so it doesn't necessarily preclude me from having to produce certain items and things, but it does protect in California consultations with experts uh, about facts, circumstances, and issues in preparation for litigation. Excellent. Uh, this is one that's uh, so uh, pertinent. Mitch and Nick have cameras at differing depth of field. Uh, I like Mitch's depth of field. How do you do this? And I'll sure. answer uh, just briefly here. Mitch is using the green screen through Zoom and he probably has a different web yep. camera than I'm currently using. I'm using a current one built into my laptop. I've got a different one on the desktop. So you may want to play with some of that. So let's be real, real quick, you guys. This is when you come out the elevator of our law firm, these are the uh, elevators and you walk into our law firm. Uh, I am using a green screen. I am broadcasting from home. 
and I'm using a service called eCam, which allows me to use the green screen technology uh, and then push this through Zoom using what's called a virtual camera. Super easy. You're going to stumble through it the first couple of times, but this is what I'm talking about is the client experience. I want the clients to be familiar with my background. So when they get off the elevator, this is what they're going to see when they meet uh, our receptionist. Okay. It's a consistent branding. I also think this for me, where I am right now, this looks better than if I didn't have the green screen set up. So we show you guys how to do this uh, in the links at streaming.lawyer in the most recent blog post. And Nick can always help you guys answer these questions. Yep. Uh, Mike asks, how do you convince an attorney to prepare the expert for depo and trial? Many need to be asked to prepare. Should this requirement be placed into the retainer agreement? I would say the answer is it's unbelievable to me that there are experts out there who are allowed to or put in the position, the awkward position of either having to write a report or appear for a deposition or trial without being properly consulted or prepped by the law firm. All right. So let's just start there. So if you're dealing with lawyers and that's what they expect or want, you're probably dealing with the law, wrong law firms. That, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother webinar, but uh, put it in your retainer agreement, include a provision that talks about, uh, if you're going to be expected to provide expert testimony during arbitration, mediation, deposition, or trial, it's agreed between the parties that uh, counsel retaining you will put aside uh, one to three hours of his or her time to properly answer, uh, prepare you for the deposition, for trial, uh, to answer your questions, you know, whatever it might be. Yeah, put it in your retainer agreement and then hold them to it. Good question. Good. Sanjay asks, I had a successful Daubert challenge against me. I was not able to testify. It was not his fault. Plaintiff did not provide objective evidence of a claim, uh, having seen the psychiatrist. Would it have a long-term impact? It depends. I mean, that's why when you're contacted by counsel about offering an expert opinion, make sure everything you need is provided to you and make sure everything you need to know from counsel is provided to you so that you're, you can determine whether or not you're the right uh, expert for that particular case. So that goes back to day one. And once again, uh, it just depends. Yeah. Uh, Martin asks, who is the author of the social media book? Uh, that'd be yours truly. <laughs> Jackson is. This is, this is an old cover you guys, but it's the ultimate guide to social media for business owners, professionals, and entrepreneurs. Here's the thing. It's, my friends contributed chapters, okay? Uh, you know, experts on Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, live video, blogging. Nick shared some amazing tips in the chapter that he was a contributing author to. Uh, Bob Berg on the go-giver attitude. Um, uh, different, different gifted keynote speakers, different gifted uh, professionals in the communication section on how to communicate in different ways to communicate. It's really good. It's Excellent. available at amazon.com. Kindle, Excellent. audible, and paperback. All of them. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else we, uh, we're getting some people who have really enjoyed this. Thanks kindly good. gentlemen. Uh, let's see. When do we get distance depots? I think that's the same that we just answered. Uh, Tim asks, can you review those seven tips one more time? Absolutely. And while I'm doing that, uh, Stephen asked, do I recommend how to win friends and influence people by Dale Carnegie? Absolutely. It's more relevant today than it's ever been. And I actually shared a couple of blog posts on applying Carnegie's approaches back then with social media today. If you, have, if you want the link, Google that title with my name or reach out to me and I'll send you the link. Uh, the topics we talked about were after the basics of credentials and qualifications, next level, people skills, communication skills, being a professional and sharing and, and relating and developing rapport with, uh, with your audience, whether it's an attorney in a deposition or a jury or judge in trial. Number five is your retainer agreements, prices, terms, conditions. It avoids misunderstandings and helps avoid you being in an uncomfortable position 
of expected to give an expert opinion when you're not being paid to do it, or frankly, the attorney doesn't provide you with everything you need, and he or she promised a year earlier. Uh, number five, reliability. Take initiative, take action for the lawyer who hires you, make it easy for him or her. Number six, honesty, no upfront, uh, upfront information and disclosure, and no unpleasant surprises after the fact. So those are the six tips. Excellent. Uh, let's see what else we have. I'm going to go to the, uh, uh, Ron audience. says, Ron says, uh, mediation lawyer dot live is getting gets blocked by bit defender. Uh, that's probably a setting on his own browser is my guess. That's the experience. I had no problem, uh, getting to the mediation lawyer website, uh, earlier. Uh, so bit defender may be your own, um, security on your end, Ron. No, that, I agree with you on that. I'm looking at an earlier answer to my question. What if you're asked a question during a deposition, you're uncomfortable with answering it, you don't want to answer it, um, and uh, the lawyer says, you know what, you can please answer the question first and then we'll take a break. I would follow your lawyer's uh, recommendation. In other words, uh, he or she hopefully is up to speed on the local code of civil procedure for that state, evidence codes, what's permissible as a depot. It's your lawyer's job during a deposition to make sure that the only questions you answer are questions that you're obligated to respond to. And if you don't answer a question, one of two things are going to happen. One of three things are going to happen, you guys, and it might not be the end of the world. Number one, the depot gets continued, uh, the attorneys argue about it, and maybe you'll have to come back in and answer to the question that you'll agree to do. Number two, the other side brings a motion to compel your answer to that question. There may be sanctions involved, you know, uh, so it might be a couple of thousand dollars of your time. Uh, number three, nothing happens at all. Everyone just lets it go. It, it's a minor question that the lawyer wanted answered and nobody wants to spend the time or money and there's gamesmanship happening during the depot. They make it seem like a big deal, but it's really not. Follow your lawyer's advice or lead on that. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Nick, but I'm just going to okay. some, some old questions. Here. Craig had a, had some good one here. How does an expert deal with a situation whereby his client has not provided critical discovery, such as deposition testimony for him or her to review prior to appearing uh, to testify at deposition? So and it goes a little further. Yeah. The expert had enough information to prepare an initial report, but opinions may change if given the opportunity to review additional discovery. I would reach out to the attorney and have that conversation before I can uh, provide sworn deposition testimony. I need X, Y, and Z. If the attorney refuses to provide you with that information or did not do her job and obtain those documents, those items or things through the discovery process because they didn't think about it, they were lazy, they didn't get around to it, then document your concerns in writing with the lawyer and comply with all rules of civil procedure. If you've been subpoenaed and you need to be there, then you need to show up to that deposition and answer the questions and or have it continued so you have more time to review these documents. But the bottom line is if you confirm with the party hiring you, the lawyer hiring you, that there are deficiencies in what they provided you, then it's on them and not you for because you're following the law and you're simply answering questions in a truthful fashion. Yeah, and this goes with something that I get questions about all the time, Mitch. If you're get if you're an expert and you're getting hired at the very last minute, think twice about uh, you know, when the attorney picks up the phone and says, "I need a report in 24 or 48 hours." Think twice before accepting that job. Uh, Deborah says, "Thank you. It's been very insightful. Thank you, uh, Deborah. Thank you, uh, Edward." Uh, here's Jim asks. Is it a conflict if you are an expert for an attorneys at large firm, uh, attorneys at a large firm, and a different attorney for the opposing party wants to hire you for a totally different case? So it, it sounds like Jim, like you're representing two different attorneys. Uh, you're working on a case for two different attorneys on uh, for the same firm. There should be no issue with that. Right. So as I understand the question. Um, you want to make sure you have, as an expert witness, full disclosure of who you've offered ex expert testimony for in the past. So the attorneys can, on their own, independently, even unilaterally determine whether or not there's a conflict. All right, put it back on the attorneys. As I understand your question, you want to keep track of 
who's hired you, what potential conflicts exist. You want to use some kind of CRM or database to check for conflicts of interest. It's very important. I don't think there's necessarily a conflict with you offering testimony for party A that happens to be a lawyer in a large firm, and then five years later offering testimony for attorney B, who's a sole practitioner down the street on a completely unrelated matter. Uh, if it's the same client, if it's a lawyer that worked, it just depends on the facts, but make sure there's full disclosure. And I will tell you full disclosure by way of a spreadsheet, whatever it might be, uh, will help eliminate a lot of the questions and a lot of the issues that we're seeing being asked. This is a great question by Catherine. If you're in a field that currently does not have formal education or certification, how do you answer the question about your expertise validity? She does electronic medical record forensics, and I know this is an issue in that space where I've got 20 or 30 years doing billing and medical records and forensics. And uh, I've seen plenty of experts who just have years of experience and be qualified, even if there isn't a formal training for electronic medical record forensics right. or electronic or, or medical billing specific. So the uh, standard's different in state and federal court, depending on you know where you're located, what your venue is. Uh, generally speaking, if you have uh, uh, adequate knowledge and experience as to that specific area of expertise, I think a good trial lawyer can probably qualify you to, to, uh, to be an expert. But once again, it comes down to, do you genuinely have the experience, the qualifications, that initial foundation that we didn't even spend time talking about today because it's me, you right. know, um, and uh, have a frank conversation with the attorney that's reaching out to you uh, to make sure that uh, you're a good fit for all of those reasons. And frankly, many other reasons. Right. Good. Uh, let's see. Rana says, if I, if, if asked a question about proprietary information that I am not privy to, how do I answer questions that insinuate that I am not knowledgeable just because I'm in, unable to obtain this information? So maybe information not in discovery is how I'm reading that, Rhonda. So I'm not sure about that question, but I will say I've seen some gifted experts talk about when they're asked during a deposition by opposing counsel, a question about a document that they haven't seen or information they haven't been provided. You know, counsel, that's a, the response is something like this. Counsel, that's a, that's a great question. Would you mind showing me the document that you're talking about so I have time to review it and, and answer your question as accurately as possible? Or that's a great question the proprietary information you're talking about, I haven't had an opportunity to review before today's deposition. If you'd like to make it available to me, uh, we can reschedule the remainder of today's deposition. I'd be happy to answer your questions. That's the way I would approach this. And along those same lines and depositions, one of the questions uh, that was asked that I think comes up a lot, at least here in California is, you know, do I need to, during a deposition, answer my income questions? And in California, the answer is yes. Uh, as lawyers, we are allowed to go into how much you've been paid as an expert witness over the last five or 10 years and by who and what percentage of your annual income is derived from practicing medicine as opposed to making yourself available as a consulting expert witness. I, that information is discoverable as far as tax returns. Generally, no, and your lawyer will know this and can object when you're asked to produce this information, social security numbers, generally, hopefully most experts are using tax identification numbers. So if you're not using a tax ID number, even if you're uh, an individual, you wanna set up an LLC, a corporation, generally speaking, and, and get a tax ID number so you can avoid the whole social security number type of thing. But what we normally do is instead of disclosing social security numbers in a written transcript that can be copied and placed on the internet, uh, we'll have a stipulation with opposing counsel that if for whatever reason it's relevant and it's oftentimes not, so we'll object. But if it is for a background check, uh, we'll provide it uh, uh, after the deposition in a confidential and secure fashion subject to a non-disclosure agreement by all parties to protect your identity and, and your right to privacy. Excellent. And folks, I'm not, we're not going to be able to get to all the questions. I thank you so much. This has been great. I'm going to ask one more question. I want to remind you that the 30% 30, 30 discount 
use the discount code Mitch30, Mitch30. Uh, not going to be able to get to everybody's question, but Lisa asks, uh, we'll take this as our last question, Mitch. And, okay. and uh, do you have to disclose conflict if only consulted and not testified for an attorney? So, so much what, like your experience with the uh, Frank Pia uh, lifeguard one. So you if, can, an attorney consulted you, but you haven't testified. So I think that for attorney B, the second attorney on the list that does hire you, I think it's, it's prudent and the responsible thing to do to let that attorney know that you've spoken to the other law firm or that you've consulted with the other law firm. I think it probably would create a conflict of interest or the appearance of impropriety or a conflict of interest. So be careful about that. Full disclosure, full transparency is what you want from the lawyer who's hiring you. And it's what that lawyer should expect from you when he or she hires you. Know, hires you. So, right. so, so I think full disclosure, arm's length transactions are probably the way to go. And you'll sleep better at night too. Even if there's a legal reason why you don't need to do that, it can get uncomfortable during a deposition and it can be devastating at time of trial if it hasn't earlier been disclosed. And you don't want to put yourself or the, the party who hired you in that position. This has been fun, Nick. I really appreciate it. And a lot Thank of good you, questions, Mitch. you guys. And you know, if anyone has any follow-up questions, they can reach out to me at any of the sites we talked about. And, and we... repeat your, uh, your sites for them, Mitch, and then so, we'll just close up. Sure, sure. So if you guys want to mirror, if you guys want to duplicate what I'm doing with our live video mediations, go to mediationlawyer.live. And I would suggest create something like that and then share it at experts.com uh, for your con expert consulting services or add it to your existing websites. Our law firm is jacksonandwilson.com here in Southern California. We handle catastrophic injury, wrongful death, and complicated business matters. And then just for fun, you guys, this kind of stuff, communication tips, social media stuff, you know, everything in my book, it's all over at streaming.lawyer. And for the lawyers watching this, I have a mastermind. It's a global mastermind uh, that Nick is I'm a member a of. of. So thank yep. you for that, uh, which is legalminds.lawyer, legalminds.lawyer, where we share these tips and we have weekly videos. And it's, it's a great community. It's, it's and, a great community and, and lots of great information. And your experts are more than welcome to, to join us there and learn how to build out their brands and maximize what you offer at experts.com. Excellent. Thank you, Mitch, so much for this. Thank you, everybody who stuck around for this. And uh, we'll see you soon. Stay safe, everybody. And Mitch, what's, what's your usual closeout? My usual closeout is these are tough times, but let's do our best to maximize not only our journeys, but the journey of everyone around us and work each day, you guys, to make each day your masterpiece. All right, you guys, bye-bye. Thank Bye you. All. Thanks, Thank Mitch. you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mitch.